the Robin Breeze Show. This is episode 13, and today I'm here with CEO Steve Lanes of Baggy, the Builders Association of Greater Indianapolis. We're going to review new construction, current trends in the marketplace, and rising prices in today's market. For over a decade, I've spent my career in both sales and marketing to help friends, family, and clients achieve their dreams of home ownership. Now, I'm bringing you the top stories in our cities, homes for sale, and knowledge you can use. This is the Rap and Breeze Show. Hi, thank you for watching the Rap and Breeze Show. I'm sitting here today with Steve Lane, the CEO of Baggy. Thanks for sitting with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about Baggy and how long um, you've been involved. Some history behind that. Sure. I have been involved with Baggy for 25 years. Um, started when I was 10 um, and have been very fortunate to have watched the market grow, recede and start to grow again. So it's been a really fun ride for me in the 25 years. The association is over 50 plus years old and we really simply exist to promote, educate, network people, the community and elected officials about the uh, new home building industry. Yeah, so I actually have met Steve and known Steve for quite a while because I've been in the building industry and have had the pleasure of speak, or hearing him speak um, about new construction and trends in the marketplace, and so I was really excited to sit down with you and kind of go over what we're seeing today. Um, as we've all heard, we there's really um, a seller's market out there right now, and so I wanted to, I was curious to see if that's in all parts of you know, the city, or if we're seeing that more so in other parts than others. It, it, it's interesting. As I sit in the position I am in the industry, um, not walking in the builder's shoes, but walking behind them, if you will, learning yeah. about what's going on and getting a different perspective than being in the heat of battle every day. Um, I would tell you, in the marketplace, you know, we've grown from a high way back when, um, in the, in the uh, heyday, mm -hmm. uh, 15,000 permits. We dropped down to 3,000 permits. We're at about 6,000, 7,000 permits now. Yep. Been kind of, I would call it Groundhog Day mm -hmm. through this uptick. And that means we've been growing at a steady 5 to 6%. We're not going great guns, right. um, but we're having this nice steady increase. And we're thinking we got another couple years mm -hmm. of, that increase left, of that increase left in the marketplace. Okay. But I would tell you, we have the growth areas are still the same as they were back then with a few additions. So mm -hmm. what I would tell you is, you know, you have your Greenwood, you have your Center Grove and the South Side, you go around the Horn to the um, Plainfields and the Avons mm -hmm. and the Brownsburg, those still seem to be strong markets. You keep moving around the, the, the clock, if you will, of the nine county metro area. You have Zinesville, mm -hmm. Carmel, Noblesville, Fishers, and then you kind of have a gap when you hit Greenfields, just Right. being stagnant but it's been a, a steady market you see new palestine starting to have a little bit that southeast yeah. corner but then the phenomenon i guess i would tell you is we're I, i'm calling them the vills fortville <laughs> barbersville um you know those vills in those areas that are on the fringe seem to be growing mm -hmm. um accordsville yeah. that's where the vills come from and then the only other exception that i really start to see some interesting activity occurring is lebanon Lebanon's been talked about for a few years, but you really haven't seen any marketing going or any um, new marketing of homes there. That's changed this year. We've got a couple builders who are up in Lebanon building uh, in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a combination of Whitestown okay. starting to grow up that 65 quarter. But then also that community, mm -hmm. the leaders, the elected officials have embraced that residential growth to feed that workforce. Gotcha that is building in Lebanon. And that workforce is that distribution warehousing mm -hmm. along 65. So they have embraced in that community workforce priced housing that is difficult to build in some other communities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're really kind of seeing that supply or that demand pretty high in all areas. We believe the demand outpaces the supply in every market, regardless of those that I just talked wow. about. We believe that we're undersupplying the market for a couple different reasons. One, the market itself, we have price increases that are occurring on new construction mm -hmm. um, just for commodities, you know, yeah. for the sticks and bricks and for all the things that go into the home 
that are creating a gap between existing homes mm -hmm. and new homes. That's an issue. Okay. But even more complicated than that, but I think even more impactful than that, is there's this perfect storm that has occurred in the marketplace. We've always had not in my backyard syndromes where once I've had my little piece of the pie, I don't want anybody else right. to drive on my roads and be in my area to create congestion. So we've got a NIMBY attitude that has this probably the last four years, five years grown around the tax caps mm -hmm. and tax caps are a good thing mm -hmm. but there's this unintended consequence that we're seeing in the industry that because taxes are capped at one percent of a price of a new home right there's this argument that if you do not have a three hundred fifty thousand dollar house to pay three thousand five hundred dollars in taxes those houses below three hundred fifty thousand dollars are not paying their fair share yeah so therefore entitlement the zoning process for anything that we would call under three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, maybe even arguably that workforce price demand houses that if you look in Central Indiana, our median household incomes in the fifty thousand dollar range, right. that's probably about a two hundred, two hundred twenty-five thousand dollar house. Mm -hmm. We can't get that zoned. So we have this juxtaposition of creating jobs in this marketplace at fifty thousand okay. dollars but we're not letting the new houses take place. So the other segment of our industry, the multifamily side, mm -hmm. I think is filling that gap. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What other factors do you think are affecting the supply and demand? So we have, I guess, two things I'll say. One, first and foremost, if our market was growing any stronger than it is right now, we're not confident we could build the houses mm -hmm. because of the workforce. Yeah. We have some workforce development issues that are keeping a, I'm going to say keeping in check our ability to grow more houses. So I have members who would love to say that we're growing 10, 15% a year, that we probably could, mm -hmm. because back to my earlier statements, we think we're leaving because of that lack of ability to zone for the workforce price housing. We think we right. could grow this market about 30%. Okay. On the flip side of that, the members say if we grew 30% or even grew 10%, where we would get the people to build those houses. Right. So it's just right now chugging along at 5 6% a year growth. That's just being able to keep that housing, those houses built with the workforce we have. So we've right. created some, ish, some initiatives within the association to try to change that discussion, to try to make people understand that there are lots of great opportunities mm -hmm. within the industry um, for people to look at. The other piece of the puzzle that I I think we have to make ourselves aware of, and this is elected officials, communities, us as an industry, are the changing demographics. Yeah. So we have empty nesters and millennials who are driving factors in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, they want something different than they did 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. And our zoning ordinances, mm -hmm. our paradigms about development are all... 20 or 30 year old around large lots, yeah. low density, mm -hmm. suburban as we knew it historically development, and those changing demographics really want things like the Village of West Clay, right. or that downtown type of development that arguably Bargersville's trying to create, Noblesville's creating, yeah. Fishers is creating, but that isn't the way the zoning standards are set up so give me a few examples of like what are when when a builder goes in to get approval to build in a certain area what are some examples of things that the municipalities are requiring that buyers aren't necessarily you know willing to pay the price for i'll give you a tangible example that everybody knows of and can relate to and that's the village of west clay okay. even though it's a decade plus old development mm -hmm. it is a development that i would say is like the new term that's being coined of suburban, you have the the suburban amenities and suburban feel yeah. in an urban type of setting, mm -hmm. but you aren't in a downtown urban environment like Marion County. Right. That seems to be what a lot of millennial and empty nesters want. Mm -hmm. So you either have a suburban interest and you want, or an urban interest, and you want to be downtown, or you want that kind of feel of trails and locations near restaurants and mm -hmm. shops and everything else, mm -hmm. but you don't want that grittiness of downtown. Right. Village of West Clay, perfect example. So it's high density mm -hmm. in our world. Yeah. Um, it, it's not high density in a lot of other urban markets, but it's high density. Right. 
it has small lots, mm -hmm. alley fed, very little setbacks from the roads and between houses. Mm -hmm. That development cannot be replicated without very serious and long protracted entitlement discussions with communities. Okay. So everybody looks at a community like that and says, okay, that's what those demographics want. Mm -hmm. We like that as a community. That's nice to have. Mm -hmm. But no zoning ordinances really allow that to take place. So you can't take an idea of a village of West Clay and move it into Westfield mm -hmm. without entitlement costs that make it so cost prohibitive to do. Yeah. The industry reverts back to, okay, well, if the ordinances allow us to do this, we really think we can would like to do this, mm -hmm. but it's so hard to get from point A to point B, we'll do what, what the ordinances allow us to do. So there's gotcha. this kind of you know, dichotomy of everybody wants something different, yeah. but we have these antiquated zoning standards and philosophies and paradigms yeah. that haven't shifted yet. Right. So is there anything that you've seen that builders have done that they can do to kind of you know, be more appealing towards the empty nesters or the millennial buyers today? Certainly, and, and you know, it's looking at infill lots, yeah. you know, so you have examples um, in Marion County of um, builders going in and recognizing that, okay, there's a 10, 15 acre piece of ground. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably prime for us to get a smaller lot, mm -hmm. higher density product developed that meets the demand of that millennial and or that empty nester. Yeah. Um, we have communities and developers, and I'll use Republic Development in um, that, call it Fishers Noblesville area around exit 210. Yeah. Saxony, uh -huh. where they have gone in and they're zoning and developing and building things yeah. along those lines. Um, it's a really successful. You know, you have developers and builders who have broken out of that 20 or 30 year old paradigm. So think about 20 year old development where what we wanted as in, as a consumer mm -hmm. was developed was large lots. Mm -hmm. Everybody lived out of the backyard, back of their house, right. not the front of their house. Right. We wanted separation from our neighbors and we wanted to pull the tennis courts, the trails, the parks, mm -hmm. all contained within our own, in, our own little community. Yeah. And it was ours and we just stayed in our little bubble. Right. Um, we have developers who have stopped developing that way and they're developing communities and in putting emphasis with park impact fees by contributing park impact fees and road okay. impact fees to develop subdivisions that then get and then provide funding to communities mm -hmm. to provide those parks and trails okay. and infrastructures that people want it, want, want now, yeah. but not necessarily be like within community. the city versus yep. within the community. Correct. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. You really answered a lot of my questions without me even having to ask. But I've been known to talk a little bit. So. <laughs> but I appreciate your time, and I really wanted also anybody who wants to get involved with Baggy, if you could kind of speak to how someone could get involved, um, who they would contact, and yeah. So I would tell you from you know, if you're a realtor or even a consumer in this marketplace, Baggy's a great resource for you to be able to find a builder, find a home in the marketplace. And it's very simple visiting www.baggy.com yeah. and we have a button we have two tabs you can either search by location or you can search by builder and product to find the home you're looking for in the marketplace the, that's the other way to get involved so yeah. if you are a realtor in this marketplace and you're interested in learning more about the industry and how to how to help become part of and i'm going to throw a number at you that's a pretty big number mm -hmm. When you look at the 2017 permits, so we had about 6,800 permits, mm -hmm. that was about 1.8 billion with a B oh or homes of construction. Wow. So if you're a realtor, that's $1.8 billion worth of commissions you could be a part of yeah. by being engaged with Baggy. And again, baggy.com would give you all the information about how to get involved. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity.